I moment ja de començar aquesta segona sessió de la Jornada Catalana de la Mobilitat que es titula Experiències Internacionals. Per parlar-nos sobre aquesta qüestió, demanaria que vinguin a l'escenari els tres ponents de la sessió. Els convido a seure en els tamborets per aquest ordre. La senyora Iona Polanen, Head of Hurley Markets, responsable de primers mercats de l'empresa Mass Global. Hi, Iona. Can you take a seat? El senyor Sergi Vila, responsable d'operacions i finances de Seat Metropolis Lab Barcelona. I el senyor Roger Thiel, president de Demand Trans Solutions. Estava aquí fa un moment, eh, en Roger? Yeah. Hi, Roger. You can take a seat. Thank you. Moltes gràcies a tots. Començarà a les intervencions la senyora Iona Polan, Head of Hurley Markets de Mass Global. La senyora Polanen ens ajudarà a tenir una comprensió més profunda de la visió que hi ha darrere de la mobilitat com a servei i de com l'aplicació de mobilitat WIME ajuda a revolucionar el transport en el futur. So, Iona, you can talk from this chair or from the... Ok, that's fine. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, so, as said, my name is Jona Berlinen and I'm the head of early markets at our Mass Global team. So, the company name is Mass Global, but our service brand is called WIM. And uh, I will be talking today about uh, mobility as a service and how we have been creating our WIM service based on this concept. And I assume that uh, most of here already know what mobility as a service means. So, of course, the basic idea of that is to combine all the different transport modes from public transportation to different taxi services, car services, bike services, and it can be, it can be actually whatever transportation innovation uh, enters the transportation market. And we try to bring those uh, services into one easy to use solution. But the thing is, we are not only trying to uh, put those into one, we also try to put those into these monthly subscription packages. And I will be showing you some examples a bit later uh, in my presentation. Uh, while we are developing our service, uh, we are actually trying to answer the, this specific question. So what would it really take from an individual to get rid of their privately owned car? Uh, we think that it can not happen by forcing or managing people, but we simply need to be able to provide more desirable alternatives for people that they would be willing to do that shift. And I think to make the kind of a successful mass service, it needs to stand in comparison what the private car today uh, provides for individuals. Um, I would like to ask, even though it's hard to see you with these lights, but how many of you are owning a car? Can you raise your hands? Okay, okay, quite many hands up. Okay, uh, then another question. How many of you are owning your dream car? Hands? No hands? One hand up, okay. One, one or a couple people are actually owning their dream car. But it's actually quite uh, a thing for many that they are, they are owning a car, but they don't have the car that they would like to have. Uh, but at the same time, they are willing to spend enormous amount of money into their private car ownership. So actually the average uh, money spent in the private car ownership by Europeans is over 600 euros per month. But at the same time, the usage of a car is only 4%. So you can see the mismatch uh, in these figures. And if we start thinking of the kind of the total mobility consumption of the people, actually 76% of your money is going into private car ownership. So it really doesn't make sense uh, why, well actually it still makes sense why people are so willing to put that money in the private car. Because I don't think that uh, today there exists uh, similar services that would have uh, same service level promise that the private car is today uh, providing for people. Uh, well, what we are of course then aiming to do uh, with this uh, mass type of solution uh, is to grow uh, to use it of the existing transport services. So if, if mentioned uh, that 76% of your money is today with the private car ownership, 
And today, actually, only 24% of the services are accessible uh, for the individuals. Of course, our goal is to break this 76% piece into use of 100% of the services. So we really want to have all the services accessible for the individuals. And I think it's not only about uh, getting from A to B, because when we think why people are purchasing cars, they are actually not thinking their next trip, they are actually thinking their trips for the next six months or ex even for one year. So we need to go way beyond with this whole mobility as a service idea. And we really believe that uh, to create this successful mass service, we need to be able to also excite people. And in that sense, we see that it's really important to provide something that is even better than owning a car. So provide this roaming environment in transportation. So away from this ownership model that brings all the inconvenience with, with, with it, uh, to go to this ultimate freedom of tomorrow with variety of services worldwide. And to give you an example, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have these uh, monthly subscription packages for your uh, mobility. Uh, it could mean that uh, now that I have a subscription package in my use in Helsinki in Finland, and when I'm traveling to, for example, Barcelona, uh, I could be using the same uh, subscription package wherever I go, and I don't need to take care of the hassle that what type of local services I can be using. I will be immediately seeing that, well, these are the best possible uh, local services, and I have easy way to access to those services. Uh, I would say also uh, we are always talking about mobility as a service, but I think we should be talking also about mobility as a lifestyle, because the private car is a lifestyle for many, and we need to get to the same uh, le level uh, with mobility as a service. Uh, and at the same time, it's very important that the public transportation will remain as a backbone for the whole mobility as a service and our future mobility, because there will, will never be a way to get to our goals with uh, sustainability and so on if we don't have public transportation there as a backbone. But to get to the same service level as the private car offers today for the individuals, we need to have those additional services combined with the public transportation and really serviceize the people. Well, uh, let's go then to what we are actually doing today. Uh, so as said, our service uh, name is called WIM, and our service promise for the people is to provide your every move, move on a WIM, so really provide this uh, spontaneous way of traveling uh, for people. And we are today uh, live with our service uh, in, in Helsinki, in Finland, where I'm coming from. Uh, also in U United Kingdom in uh, Birmingham area, so it's the West Midlands area there, and then in Belgium in Antwerpen. And we are aiming to launch the service in several additional cities still uh, this year. Um, we basically, what we are doing with the service, uh, we are not acting only as a like multimodal route planner. I think some may think quite often that mobility as a service is same as having this multimodal route planner. Uh, but we, we of course have the route planning also as part of the application, but on top of that we also provide always the ticketing and payments as part of the uh, service. So it could mean that uh, you kind of download the application free of charge, uh, then you do the registration for the application and you add your payment details once to the application and then you will be able to use all the services that exist as part of the service. So really to make it easy for the, for, for the people. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have these uh, monthly subscription packages. Uh, we also have the pay as you go. So you can, with pay as you go, you can try the service to buy uh, single tickets, for example, one public transportation ticket or one taxi ride. Or then if you take uh, either WIM Urban or WIM Unlimited package, uh, you will get uh, different type of benefits how to use the, use the existing uh, transport services. So in WIM Urban package, you are getting uh, unlimited use of public transportation and bike sharing. And then you get some additional benefits to use different taxi services and car services. And then in WIM Unlimited package, you are actually getting uh, unlimited use of everything. So you get everything from public transportation 
and bike shares, uh, taxi services, car rentals, car sharing, and we are soon adding also a new type of services on top of the service offering. Um, quite many are of course asking what, what are the prices of those packages. The urban is around 50 euros and the unlimited is around 500 euros. And of course that's closer to the private car ownership. And it was quite surprising that when we uh, launched this unlimited package, uh, we started getting immediately some calls from big corporates that, hey, you have you have created a great solution for us to replace our company cars with this uh, service that is providing way more than only the car for our employees. We get also the public transportation and the taxis and the cars. So it's, it's a perfect solution for them because they are anyways in a shift that they need to find ways that how they can also reach the sustainability goals. And we are very happy that we are actually able to provide this type of service for, for them. We are already having some pilots ongoing and uh, there have been already some interesting discussion with many to continue that. Uh, it's very important for us that uh, we are basically not operating any transportation by ourselves, but we are always cooperating with uh, different type of public and private uh, existing transport service providers because I think we have plenty of uh, great services already existing, uh, but we just want to find out that how we can make even better uh, use of those services and how to make the whole transportation more functional. And it means that it doesn't work if we work only with private or only with public, but it needs to be a combination of both. And this is also the key how we are able to scale the service, because of course if the pieces already exist, it will be way easier to uh, create this roaming environment in transportation <coughs> and provide this uh, excitement for people that wherever they want to go, whatever time, it will be possible for them. Um, we have now uh, around uh, something like 70,000 uh, registered users for the application and around 10,000 monthly subscribers. And we are quite happy to see that uh, people have been already doing over 4 million uh, rides with the WIM service. Uh, behind or in the picture you can actually see some simulations how people are traveling uh, with the service in Helsinki. Um, then uh, we are actually already thinking of ways that what additional things we could be doing, uh, not to focus only on transportation. Uh, so we have been trialing a couple of things already. Uh, that part, uh, we were working together with uh, Helsinki Design Week uh, last fall. And uh, it was one week event in Helsinki. And uh, during the week, uh, we were actually bringing all the Helsinki Design Week events to the map view of WIM. And when you were clicking these small red buttons over there, you were getting the, the details of the event. And by clicking this uh, uh, get there button, you were actually able to get also the travel tickets to go to that event. Uh, and it was receiving a lot of positive feedback because of course it was uh, making it way easier for the for the actual users. Uh, then now, uh, right now we are doing uh, the collaboration with uh, Helsinki marketing team and the Chinese uh, uh, giant called Tencent. Uh, so uh, in China, uh, of course, I would say it's something like 99% of the Chinese people are actually using Tencent's uh, WeChat as their solution for almost everything for public transportation, for payments and so on. Uh, so while we started the collaboration with them, uh, we agreed that we will be bringing WIM uh, as part of this WeChat mini program. And now whenever they are traveling any Chinese tourists to Helsinki, they will be actually getting the WIM app in their own language in Chinese. And we are not only providing them travel tickets, but we are also combining that uh, with the best possible uh, touristic tips of uh, Helsinki and the regional area. So very excited of that. We are now in the integration phase and we will be launching the service in a couple of months, months in, in Finland. Um, I think there are quite many also interested that how we are actually able to do this and how we could be also uh, seeing this service in our region. Uh, so to give you an example how we are at least doing it, uh, I would say there are at least these two steps that are critical for the 
uh, implementation of mobility as a service. So of course, uh, the number one thing is that there needs to be actually the willingness of those existing transport service providers to work with us. And it means that we are actually doing a commercial agreement with each of those service providers. And as part of the agreement, we are then accruing the details that what type of pricing they are offering to us and so on. Uh, we believe that that's a good starting combination for mobility as a service, so to have public transportation as a backbone, then enough access to taxis and access to some car services, and then we try to research that what additional services there should be as part of the package. Uh, then the number two is to have this uh, technical readiness of those transport services, because if that doesn't exist, it will be impossible to do this uh, mobile-based uh, mass solution. So it means that uh, there should be uh, APIs available, uh, and it means that it's not enough that there is only the uh, information about the transport services, about the disturbances or the schedules or the pricing info, but we also need to have uh, those background payments, uh, ticketing, validation and hailing because otherwise I don't think any of the end users are paying for the data or for the information actually what they are actually going to be paying is for the transport services itself and to make it easy easier for them there needs to be access to use those services and then, of course, uh, we really believe in this model that uh, we should be making public transportation even more attractive than it used to be. Uh, so our at least recommendation would be to shift those uh, public transportation stations to more of these type of uh, mobility hubs. So to get public transportation as connected as possible and there should be some dedicated areas for these new type of services that are coming all the time in the markets. Um, well, maybe to repeat a bit of this same thing as in the earlier slide, uh, with public transportation it can be the API or it can be also these contactless payments so that you use credit card for example at the gates to pay your ticket and with other transport services they need to have also those APIs in place. Um, then I want to share some early results of what we have been able to do with WIM because we just re released a couple of weeks ago our first ever uh, WIMPACT study. And uh, this study was based on uh, our first year's, uh, one full year's uh, data, actual data of the users. And we uh, had external consultancy called Rumpel analyzing the data. And it was quite exciting to see uh, that based on the usage of the service right now, uh, we can see that public transportation has been the backbone for the, for the service itself. And uh, actually the WIM users have been doing even more uh, trips with public transportation than some of the average Helsinki users. Uh, then it was great to see also that people are actually uh, using the service in multimodal way. Uh, so already 42% uh, of the WIM users have been combining their trips, uh, city bike trips, with the use of public transportation. And then uh, uh, WIM users have been combining taxi already three times uh, more often with public transportation than average users in Helsinki. Uh, then we were able to see also that, of course, when we are trying to replace the usage of the private car ownership with the use of different type of services, of course, they will be doing uh, or replacing some of the trips also with taxis, not only with public transportation. So we have been already seeing that people uh, have been doing 2.25 times more of those taxi trips uh, with the use of WIM. And I think this is also a very, very important uh, factor for us. As I mentioned, this sustainability is a big topic for all of us. So we have seen that people of WIM have been already traveling around the world uh, five times, and we have been able to save already 20 tons of CO2 emissions with the usage of WIM. Um, I would like to remind still uh, that, of course, when we are talking about uh, users of uh, transport services, uh, people are actually quite demanding. So even though we are receiving a lot of positive feedback from uh, multiple amount of people, but still they are all the time demanding even more. And 
these are some of the comments that we are getting from the people. So they are willing to have, for example, different type of ticket types for their use. Uh, they want to have more service options. It's actually great to see that they are uh, automatically suggesting to us also that, hey, you should have these cool new services that are coming to my, my city, that could you bring those as part of your monthly subscription package? Then they are actually, as we have now these two uh, first subscription packages available, they are also asking, for example, these uh, specific package types for families or for for students and so on. So people are all the time demanding more. And I would say it's good to rem remember that the users are actually the ones that are dictating those services. So it doesn't matter what we as a company or any, for example, public authority is saying that what we should be doing, it's the users that are anyways the ones deciding that what, what we should be serving uh, for them. And in that sense, I would say that uh, when talking about mobility as a service, a uh, customer really deserves this uh, one-stop shop because if we ask from people that, hey, do you want to have only uh, public transportation and uh, taxis as part of your service, most likely they say uh, that, no, I actually want to have everything that exists around me. And then uh, it's very much said uh, from the people that they want to have choice of an operator. So I don't believe that they would be satisfied that if in the future we would be only a mass operator in the markets. We welcome the competition and there should come also more uh, alternatives for the, for the end users when talking about mobility as a service. And then, uh, of course, those uh, roaming subscriptions are also important. Uh, here are a couple of ways how the markets in mobility as service could be evolving. Uh, so as you can see, uh, all of these uh, individual transport service providers are having their own ecosystems. Uh, and then we can see kind of three different ways how it could be uh, transferring in the markets. Uh, First of all, there could be this winner takes it all type of model. There could be Google or it could be Uber that would kind of try, try to power the game uh, with money and by purchasing, for example, services as Uber is, for example, now doing. Uh, I'm not quite sure if that will work out because the whole mobility markets, market is so big that I don't, I don't really believe that uh, by having money uh, you can start just purchasing everything that exists in the markets. Uh, then there could be this uh, public transportation takes it all type of model. Uh, I think it's actually good that also public transportation is doing uh, mobility as a service, but I, I just hope that uh, it will not block other type of mass services from the markets because of course public transportation is quite often uh, serving more in the in the kind of limited uh, circle. So it could be citywide service or maybe <coughs> national service. But as I said earlier, if we, we, if we want to together excite people, we should be able to provide this uh, roaming environment that wherever you go, we make it easy for you. Uh, so in that sense, we, we really believe in this open uh, mass ecosystem uh, where there will be actually different type of mass operators they might have uh, also different type of target segments, maybe different type of pricing models, different type of subscription packages, or maybe no subscriptions at all. And then they will be competing that kind of uh, what type of service groups they can be uh, uh, serving the best. Uh, if we start thinking then um, what are kind of the most traditional uh, transport services uh, in the uh, past years, I would say those are public transportation and then the privately owned car. Uh, and if we think uh, that today there starts to come uh, all these new type of transport services in between of these two uh, services, uh, they're coming e-scooters and so on <clears throat> and so on. Uh, but then if we think uh, that which one will open first, uh, it will mean also that which direction these uh, different type of transport services will start to connect first. So if it would be a car that opens first, uh, it means that most of the services will be uh, more connected with the, uh, with the car services. But then if it will be public transportation, then of course public transportation will gain the most of the benefits uh, with this whole uh, new mobility revolution. 
so in that sense, I think uh, it's important uh, kind of Europe to lead the way that we will show that it will be public transportation uh, kind of a run uh, mo model in mobility because if we then think that in US they are already doing also mobility as a service there it will be way more car based and I think now it's the time to kind of uh, create those uh, regulations and guidelines and the game rules that how, how the whole market will evolve and I still want to show this slide that it's it's really about this uh, open ecosystem and not the ecosystem. Uh, as I mentioned, there will come competition and then the user is the one uh, choosing what, what will serve the best uh, their needs. And just at the, at the end, uh, I would like to remind that uh, tech technology actually uh, uh, develops, develops quite fast. Uh, so we should be really uh, w woken up that we we cannot start uh, still waiting for years and years before we start doing this. We really need to start acting now. If these services uh, have not been here around 10 years or even less, uh, and how, be, how fast people are adapting to these new services, we need to notice that technology is now advancing even faster. So we really need to start acting now and start creating fast these mass type of services. And to remember also that uh, also these AVs are closer than ever. I've already seen articles saying that the first self-driving taxis will be here in 2021. Let's see with what will happen, but it's still important to notice that uh, when the AVs actually hit the roads, it will mean that uh, why on earth people would be anymore uh, doing their trips, for example, with public transportation, if, because if, if the AVs are able to produce the service with cheaper cost, because they don't need to care about the driver's costs, and then they are able to take you from door to door, so why on earth people would be anymore walking from home to the station and then taking to whatever public transportation mode and then go to the next destination. So that in short, uh, I think I exceeded my time, sorry for that, <laughs> but uh, more than happy to have uh, discussions after and get some questions maybe right. after this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias, Jona Polanen. Ara, a continuació, és el torn del senyor Sergi Vila responsable de operacions i finances de Seat Metropolis Lab Barcelona. El senyor Vila ens parlarà de dues noves solucions de mobilitat. Bas on Dimen, una solució per un transport flexible sota demanda i de Comuti, una solució per compartir viatges habituals entre casa i al lloc de treball. Perfecte, moltes gràcies. Si necessites passar per aquí. Bueno, primer de tot, donar les gràcies a l'AMTU, el fet que puguem participar en aquesta jornada, crec que és molt important. Jo represento la indústria d'automòbil i SEAT, com a indústria d'automòbil, està afrontant una transformació que, com bé la Jona ens ha estat explicant, és una transformació molt gran. Llavors us explicaré la primera part una mica el canvi d'orientació que estem fent a nivell de tota la companyia, de tota la corporació, i després entrarem en concret amb els productes que estem desenvolupant, dels quals van tots vinculats amb temes de transport flexible, que és el que ens ocupa amb la jornada d'avui, i en nous models de mobilitat que anirem treballant de cara al futur. Perquè tingueu una mica la foto, nosaltres com a grup SEAT fa dos anys, a nivell de, no només del grup SEAT, sinó a nivell de tot el grup Volkswagen, es va prendre la decisió de fer tot un procés de disrupció digital intern, en el qual no només estàvem pensant en canviar els nostres models tradicionals de com desenvolupem, sinó canviar el model de negoci. Estem evolucionant cap a poder ser un proveïdor de serveis de mobilitat, per tant, globalment, tota la maquinària que hem tingut històrica per fabricar cotxes i per ser el líder mundial a nivell de fabricació d'automòbils, no ens servia per afrontar el repte aquest. Llavors, el que vam fer, analitzant aquesta situació, va ser crear Metropolis Lab, que és una empresa que penja del grup SEAT, en la qual estem treballant en una manera similar al que és una start-up. Hem fet un procés de disrupció, per començar pràcticament des de zero, perquè no tenim experiència a nivell de desenvolupament de software, i estem creixent per poder competir en un entorn que és un entorn molt competitiu, com ja hem vist en la presentació anterior, i com podem veure amb aquest slide que us he preparat aquí una mica perquè tingueu la foto del que està passant a nivell mundial amb el sector d'automoció. És una revolució amb tota regla, 
Els experts parlen que durant els propers 10 anys, 2020-2030, realment es produirà aquesta transició i el que estem fent és preparar-nos. Tots els grups estan fent accions semblants, tots els OEMs, els que fins ara han sigut molt actius ha sigut tota la gent de Daimler i BMW que han fet una joint venture entre ells i el passat Mobile World Congress van presentar Freenow, Renault té accions també, Toyota també està treballant en aquest sentit, General Motors, Pivotal i el grup Volkswagen amb l'adquisició de Get i la creació de Metropolis Lab i d'altres iniciatives digitals que hi ha està afrontant una mica aquesta transició, aquest canvi. El tema que us comento de constituir una empresa independent dotada d'unes eines diferents és molt important, és una cosa que Wim, segur que quan van començar van començar 10 o 20 persones. Nosaltres veníem d'un grup que aquí a Catalunya som 14.000 persones treballant i no podíem fer una transformació del grup, per tant vam crear una empresa dotada amb les eines que té qualsevol startup, un grup petit, en el qual ens hem dotat de les eines i dels processos que es treballen amb qualsevol de les startups que estan treballant en l'ecosistema de Barcelona o a nivell mundial. Estem ubicats al Pier 01, bàsicament per dos motius. El primer motiu és perquè volem atreure talent i volem realment ser un focus d'innovació a nivell del país. I també pel fet de l'acord que tenim amb el Tech City i amb la comunitat de Barcelona per anar creixent en temes de mobilitat. Estem treballant conjuntament també amb l'administració i volem treballar també amb l'AMTU, amb l'Ajuntament de Barcelona, tenim col·laboracions, de cara a poder treballar l'administració privada l'administració pública i el sector privat que puguem treballar conjuntament per definir la mobilitat del futur. Tenim tots la consciència que el model, i ho hem vist en la presentació anterior i també ha sortit abans amb la Carme, com ha comentat, el model de transport privat i públic canvia durant aquests 10 anys. Per tant, el que hem de fer és intentar col·laborar per definir quins models de mobilitat volem perquè siguin sostenibles i perquè realment puguem avançar cap al següent nivell de mobilitat. L'equip, som un equip que actualment som 21 persones, és tot un equip tecnològic, gent amb molta expertisa a nivell de desenvolupament de software amb tot tipus de start-ups del país, des de Wallapop, Edreams, MyTaxi, hem anat agafant gent de molts àmbits diferents de cara a poder complir l'objectiu de treballar amb una filosofia completament nova i diferent. Llavors, atacant una mica el tema de mobilitat i una mica la direcció cap on estem avançant i avançarem els propers anys, aquests són els tres grans punts, que són els tres trens que s'està treballant a nivell mundial perquè ens portaran a la mobilitat. Hi ha tota una part que és el tema del cotxe autònom i de la mobilitat autònoma, que és una cosa que està molt vinculada amb el hardware i és una cosa que a nivell del grup Volkswagen s'està treballant bàsicament per els companys d'Audi, estan fent tot el parc d'aquest desenvolupament. Hi ha tota una altra part que és el tema de cotxe connectat, tot el que implica la connexió del cotxe a través de les xarxes de 5G en el futur i la implicació que tindrà això a nivell de mobilitat. I finalment hi ha una part de sharing. La part d'aquesta sharing és la que nosaltres com a Metropolis Lab hem treballat des del principi perquè és la que entenem que ha de ser la que en els propers anys marqui una mica la tendència a nivell de mercat i de mobilitat. Aquí amb aquest slide us mostro una mica el mateix que hem vist a la presentació anterior, que és el fet que som conscients, com a fabricant de cotxe, som conscients que hi ha una transformació i que el model de cotxe en propietat és una cosa que anirà canviant en els propers anys i que probablement les generacions noves ja no tenen el mateix concepte que hem tingut a les generacions anteriors, de tindre un cotxe en propietat, i aquesta evolució es donarà. I llavors, precisament, l'evolució nosaltres la veiem amb el fet que el primer punt és el tema de viatge compartit, el fet que cada vegada tenim més problemes de mobilitat a les grans ciutats. Jo sempre poso l'exemple de Barcelona, perquè és el que tenim més proper. A Barcelona cada dia entren més d'un milió de cotxes de fora d'àrea metropolitana a l'interior de la ciutat, dels quals el 70% van conduir més per una persona. Llavors, això és una cosa que a nivell de mobilitat ens provoca problemes i nosaltres mateixos, tot i ser un fabricant d'automoció, estem treballant per donar eines i solucionar aquesta problemàtica. Aquesta és una mica l'evolució que nosaltres pintem i en la qual estem treballant amb els projectes que estem desenvolupant. Llavors, entrant en concret en els productes que nosaltres tenim, us he portat aquí el primer producte que hem desenvolupat, que és un producte de visualització de dades de la ciutat, en aquest cas la ciutat de Barcelona, gràcies a l'acord que vam fer en el seu dia amb l'Ada Colau, hem treballat amb tot el tema d'open data de la ciutat. Abans també ha sortit el concepte que les dades són importants. Amb aquest exercici el que vam voler fer va ser buscar totes les fonts d'informació de la ciutat de cara a poder saber on estan els punts de càrrega 
de cotxes elèctrics, on estan els postos de bicing, tota la informació vinculada a la mobilitat per oferir-la al ciutadà i que d'alguna manera poguéssim entrar en una col·laboració per millorar aquestes dades de cara a poder definir mobilitat de cara al futur. És un producte que vam llançar al mercat, que el tenim allà, simplement va ser un exercici inicial per veure quina capacitat hi havia per poder treballar. Barcelona al final és una Smart City i podem aconseguir informació d'ella. Amb aquest exercici vam visualitzar que el nivell de qualitat de la informació que actualment està disponible, tot i que estem treballant tots en la línia que sigui millor, actualment no és suficientment robusta com per poder fer serveis de mobilitat. Llavors vam passar a la següent fase, que va ser desenvolupar la solució de Community, que és un producte que en els propers mesos estem ja en fase pilot i farem el llançament a Barcelona i a Praga, la idea que tenim de fer inicial el llançament i de cara a fer-ho extensible, vam desenvolupar Community com a eina de viatge compartit. És una eina que et permet compartir viatges, els viatges recurrents que fem cadascú de nosaltres entre casa i el lloc de treball. El que us comentava abans, el fet que majoritàriament anem tots amb un cotxe sols, doncs és una eina que fàcilment pots publicar els teus viatges, els dies que tu com a conductor vols compartir el teu vehicle, i qualsevol passatger, qualsevol usuari pot entrar a l'aplicació i veure si hi ha un viatge disponible que coincideix amb la seva ruta i si es produeix un matxing entre el conductor i el passatger, doncs pots fer el viatge complet. És una solució que ja existeix en el mercat, ja tenim competidors com Waze Carpool, com BlaBlaLines a París, però és una solució que nosaltres volem focalitzar molt en el concepte de socialment responsable. Per què? Perquè el fet que algú comparteixi el seu vehicle a diari i es preocupi de desviar-se 10 minuts de la seva ruta per acollir algú i portar-lo, etc. Tot això té una component a nivell de socialment responsable, que és la que volem explotar, incluït amb les administracions. Estem parlant amb les administracions a nivell d'AMB, etc., per quan es produeixen episodis de contaminació, que puguem realment utilitzar aquest tipus d'eines que ens poden aportar solucions ràpides. I, finalment... Us volia presentar Baibas, que és la que realment fa més, quadra més amb la proposta d'aquests dos dies de jornada. Baibas és una aplicació que hem desenvolupat que és purament de transport flexible, és una plataforma destinada a poder donar servei tant a operadors públics com a operadors privats, en els quals es pot customitzar d'una manera molt senzilla l'eina i es pot fer transport flexible. Llavors, aquesta eina, nosaltres inicialment, avui us he portat l'exemple de Martorell, perquè és el projecte que hem posat en marxa durant aquest mes. La nostra planta de Martorell al final és una petita ciutat. Som 14.000 persones treballant allà dintre i la mobilitat per nosaltres també és un problema. Llavors el que hem fet ha sigut posar un servei, en aquest cas de l'Ambres, un servei sota demanda en el qual tots els treballadors poden sol·licitar quan tenen una reunió o qualsevol punt de la fàbrica, poden agafar l'aplicació, fer la sol·licitud de quin lloc volen anar, a quina hora volen anar, i a través d'un algoritme de rutin que hem desenvolupat, els conductors van recollint els passatgers i els van portant. És un exemple que és aplicable a qualsevol altra ciutat. La idea és anar creixent aquesta plataforma i portar-ho a més ciutats. També estem treballant a Wolfsburg, en aquest cas amb un operador de transport públic, i l'estan utilitzant amb aquesta aplicació per als serveis que utilitzen durant el camp de setmana per poder tindre intel·ligència aplicada al transport, en el qual implica optimitzar la quantitat de vehicles que hi ha, i sobretot, al final, extreure dades per poder analitzar i poder tindre la mobilitat del futur que tots volem, amb més qualitat i amb més sostenibilitat. Aquesta és la intervenció. Moltes gràcies. Moltes gràcies, senyor Vilà. Ara és el moment del tercer ponent, el senyor Roger Til, president de Dimens Trend Solutions. Se'ns parlarà de l'experiència internacional en serveis de transport flexible i també, concretament, el cas de Dinamarca. So, I'm going to be talking today about international experiences with what I call new generation demand responsive transportation. And I'm also going to be talking about how the largest uh, demand responsive system in the world, one that's been around for about 20 years, has used technology platforms along with what I would call very smart uh, business concepts to build the sort of ecosystem of um, both uh, providers, funders, um, and um, operators that I think is relevant to any organization that is interested in scaling these types of services to a high level. So 
First, I think it's important to understand what this new era is that the quote-unquote old era wasn't. I mean, clearly, technology is, 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 a, is, is, is a very big part of this. Um, the, the, the success, if you will, of the TNCs, that's Uber and Lyft, Transportation Network Companies is the acronym we use, which even though they're not um, shared ride services in the, in the main, they, they do have shared ride components, they've, they've shown what technology platforms can do for these sorts of things. And there is also a, uh, you know, many pilot projects going on in many countries around the world these days um, you know, for, we've documented many new services in the United States. There's stuff going on in you know, Australia, Germany, UK, et cetera. I'll talk briefly about this. Um, a number of public-private partnerships, where that turns out to be quite important. They're all losing money, of course, but it, you know, because the investors are paying for this, but at least it, it's interesting to see that uh, the private sector is now also investing in these sort of new generation services. Um, one of the reasons this is happening, of course, is that the PTOs are showing some new interest in this. There's a couple reasons for that interest. Uh, one, of course, is the, the advent of the TNCs, and it's showing them that uh, they could be um, you know, beginning to lose market share. And they have lost market share in the United States, by the way. Um, and also, there's, I think, a new recognition that conventional trance has sort of played out the string. Um, ridership has plateaued in American cities after years of gradually going up. It's actually declined the last couple of years. Part of that's competition from the TNCs. But the other part of it is that there isn't much more that these, these agencies can do to attract uh, services. Um, the other thing, that I, the, a, a key point that I want to make here is that as the public sector moves into this era of new demand responsive transportation services, there's a huge lack of knowledge about what works and what doesn't. Um, I think it's noteworthy. These are, as I think one of the, the uh, individuals this morning said, these, service, these types of services are not new. They've been going on for 40 to 45 years, and many of the ones that have been going on for 40 years share exactly the same service characteristics of the ones that you hail with an app. You can get a service right now if capacity is available. There's, over, there's 500 small cities in the United States where these services operate without the benefit of this contemporary technology, and many of them have service offerings very similar to the technology-enabled ones. So there's nothing new about this. What is new is that the, publics, the public transport authorities are now becoming interested in it, and they don't really understand that much how some of these services work, and their performance expectations in, in particular are very inflated. So here's, um, these are just the, the ones that I'm talking about today, very briefly, but you can see uh, these new generation services are spread around the planet. There's, you know, the Sydney area is doing a lot of experimentation. Many places in the United States are just, just some of the more interesting ones. You know, locations in Europe too, some in Germany, the UK, uh, the, the Nordic countries. And again, others, other things are going on, but, I, but these are some of the, the more visible, well-funded ones. So... Denmark, uh, the, the services in Denmark and Belgium are the world's largest. Uh, the one in, we'll talk, we'll talk about the one in, in, in Denmark separately. The one in Belgium, about 200 vehicles and about with something like 100 service zones, basically feeder to fixed route services. It's been in place for the last several years. Relatively new technology platform, not all the bells and whistles of the new stuff, but I mean, it's, it's a, a good example of what's being done. Very few people are even aware of it. But it's, it, it's I mean, and that's what I say. A lot of this stuff is not new. It, it's maybe people's awareness of it is new, but what's going on is not new. Uh, we, we've, been, our t we've, been, we've been working in Denver since uh, 2007. That's the largest general public system in the United States. About 20 service zones, a couple thousand riders a day, an integral part of the public transport uh, system there. We've had a number of, of, other, of notable experiences in other places in the United States. For example, in Arlington, Texas, VIA, which is a private company, 
is providing all of the public transportation in the city of Arlington, which had no public transportation before, with its, um, with, with, with its business model. It's only getting 300 rides a day with a fleet of about 15 or 20 vehicles, but it's an example of an interesting public-private um, uh, market. Um, in Australia, as I indicated, transport for New South Wales is doing something like 10, 12, 15 uh, pilot projects. So all, you know, all over the world, basically, uh, these sorts of things are happening. In Germany, two very interesting public-private uh, types of relationships. Um, in the Hamburg area, uh, Volkswagen has put in place a um, shared use uh, service, you know, sh a shared ride, taxi, if you want to call that service, with, 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 with vans um, in the central area of uh, Hamburg. It's in, in conjunction with the um, public transport authority there, but it's being heavily subsidized by um, Volkswagen. Similarly, in Berlin, uh, Via, um, the Israeli company, um, has a service there as well that's uh, in conjunction with the BVG, the public transport operator there. I think they have, you know, 40, 50 vehicles now operating in that service, again, uh, subsidized by the private sector. So, um, and also we're starting to see, uh, with respect to the MOS stuff, we're beginning to see some of what we might call MOS-related services occurring in a few environments now. We've seen one in Finland, one in Switzerland. We just, we just imp we're just in the, literally this week implementing a service like this in the United States. Again, it's, it's not all of the MOS features that uh, Jonah was talking about, but again, the, the idea of a, a demand responsive service being part of a whole ecosystem of you know, primarily public transport services in what are often transportation poor environments. So all of these things are happening. I mean, it's all happening today. Most of this stuff is technology enabled. So what are some of the, the key concepts here that make it different from the old generation? There's a big emphasis on market segmentation. There's a sense that there's either the first mile, last mile access, feeder service, if you will, to um, sort of line haul, you know, high capacity, high speed public transport services. That's an important market for these type, for these new generation services. Or it's community circulation, areas where public transportation has done poorly. And now we're trying to introduce services because of their flexible nature, their more on-demand nature will at least provide some sort of better uh, service for the local people. It won't be regular public transportation. It's going to be more expensive on a passenger trip basis, but at least it replaces something that has, has been quite unsuccessful. Um, another important thing is what we call service structuring. There, the, there, there are some simple arithmetic around demand responsive services that quickly tells you they're gonna be pretty darn unproductive if you can't do service structuring. And we don't have time to go into that arithmetic today, but it's just how many miles, how many kilometers, rather, can a vehicle move in an hour? How many, how many kilometers does each trip take? How much time does it take to deviate, pick up people? You do the math, and very quickly you determine that these services can only pick up five or six passengers a vehicle service hour. Public transport usually starts around 15 passengers of a vehicle service hour. Big gap there. So the, the idea of service structuring is to bring more people into uh, proximity with the demand responsive service to be able to pick up multiple people at different locations to raise the productivity of the services. We've been successful at doing that in some of the services in Denver, but you know, in other cases, not so much. Um, and finally, this is very important, the ability to handle walk-on trips. This is the most popular thing in Denver. People can get off of a train or a bus, they can go over to the vehicle, they can get on, they can tell the driver where they want to go, they don't need a booking, they don't need a reservation, they just tell the driver where they want to go. And now, um, then the technology figures out how to distribute the passengers. I think this is, and we're now beginning to see public agencies want this feature in the tenders that they put out. So all of these things are to help differentiate this new generation from what was there before. So here's the services I was referencing in Denver. They've been operational since 2010. All of the, the red um, uh, rectangular-like areas 
how our services are. You can see that um, so, so many of them are clustered around these light rail lines that radiate out from the center. Um, and some of these services, you know, are doing quite well. Others, not so much. Um, so th that, this is where we, we, my company developed this technology platform originally was to be able to, to handle these sorts of things. So this is an example of what we would call new generation DRT, service structuring, market segmentation, use of technology, you know, walk on trips, all of those things are sort of part of the, the, the service package, the technology package that we use for this. Um, you know, again, the, 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 what we call spontaneous boarding is the walk-on trips. That's, that's the, 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 what the driver has a tablet computer where he registers trips and, you know, and, and, and starts the, the, the vehicle tours here. Here's, um, these are the various structuring elements that we use. It's checkpoints, flex routes, uh, gathering zones. People have to walk to a location to be picked up by the vehicle. Dynamic checkpoints. The checkpoints don't exist in reality. They're only, they're generated on the fly. Scheduled checkpoints. There is a, like a, a bus stop like place where the vehicle will show up on a, on a, on a not necessarily a fixed schedule, but periodically. Here again, some examples of flexible services. Again, this is more of a re route deviation. All of these things are now p much more feasible and possible with the technology and the algorithms that you know, various um, organizations have developed. Um, so let's turn to Denmark. Denmark is the world's biggest um, general public demand responsive service. Um, you can see this is where it started around 2000, and this was a few years ago, 2014. The difference between the light green color and the red color is a factor of six. So you can see in the northern part of the country, ridership has grown very substantially, and it's gone from a regionalized system that wasn't even present in all the regions to now a country ride system, still done in regions, uh, where there's substantial ridership uh, in many parts of the country. And by the way, um, Stockholm itself doesn't have that much rider. Stockholm's the upper right over there, so it does have some ridership, but it's, it's not the biggest ridership area because, again, it already has a lot of regular public transport. So the middle there, that's sort of the technology platform. The technology platform is not modern. It's actually based on scheduling technology first introduced in the late 1990s that has been successively built upon. So there's nothing th about this that's um, brand new. It's rather the refinement and the scaling of concepts that have been around for uh, quite some time. Um, basic principles, you buy resources from the market, you organize the market, you provide the ability for uh, both individuals and organizations to uh, book trips onto the platform. You, you know, utilize the capacity of the, uh, of the service providers and you provide all the back office functions of invoicing and payments to the providers. So essentially everything in this system is automated except for the ordering process, which, for, which more, mostly is done through telephone. There are web-based interfaces uh, for the agencies, but people themselves are, ba are basically still having to call in. Um, here's the scope. It's a fairly unbelievable scope. F 550 funding agencies in these six regions. Municipalities, hospitals, healthcare. I mean, just think about that. If you can wrap your arms around it, several hundred organizations in each of several regions. Service providers, over 700 service providers. More or less every private operator in Denmark wants to be part of it because there's money associated with it. Over 5,000 vehicles, 240,000 customers. That's about, that's 4% of the entire population of Denmark use this system in one year about 20,000 trips a day. This is a huge demand responsive service that's, all, that, that's, that's completely dependent upon the technology platform 
uh, that makes it possible. Um, there is a well-defined process of, of booking, um, scheduling, execution, you know, financial settlements. Um, that sort of you know, gives you an idea of what the process is. Both the supply side and the demand side are all highly organized, all run off the platform, all interactions between customers and, um, and, and funders basically occur via uh, the platform in one way or another. Um, what you can see here is at the bottom, this really has to do with the level of service that's being provided. You can make the level of service worse. Someone leaving a hospital, they might have to wait an hour and a half. They might have a, a, an hour and a half time window for pickup. Someone or a local service might have a 15 minute time window for pickup. By manipulating all these things and optimizing through a platform, they, that's how this is able to, to work. Um, so um, it, all, all the cost allocation, all of this stuff is done behind the scenes with the platform. So what are the secrets? Well, I, well, I'll end it right here. There's you know, about five or six secrets. A very well-defined and sophisticated business model. Huge use of market processes. Annual tendering for the, not what, the, um, what I'm gonna buy from you, what, you're gonna, what the price you're gonna sell it to me for. Um, um, you, heavy use of non-dedicated vehicles. 70% of all of the trips are provided in non-dedicated vehicles, only 30% in dedicated vehicles. Why? Because it's cheaper to provide many of these trips in non-dedicated vehicles, buying a trip at a time, or buying that trip and then buying the next trip and combining them together with their optimization platform. Um, and finally, and perhaps most under underappreciated, data standards, transactional data standards that make it possible for this platform to interoperate with those 773 service providers, every one of which must have technology that's adherent to these SUDI specifications which were initially developed in Sweden and now are used throughout the Nordic countries. Without that, this system wouldn't exist. So this is an example of technology platform on steroids that's you know, you know, organized and made possible the largest, what I would call new generation, uh, demand responsive system in the world. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Roger. Thank you very much.